uh, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to introduce John Oakley as our keynote speaker for this morning. Uh, John is the science director at SRC. He's focused on leading hardware security, packaging, automotive, automotive electronics and intelligent cognitive assistant research. Uh, he works closely uh, across the board with the government, with industry and university partners. And I have had the privilege of working with him for the last two years directly in helping shepherd a diverse set of programs in the SRC packaging. So I can tell you firsthand that he's a very superb organization, organizer and he's uh, very dedicated to this field. So I'm really, really pleased that he's here. He accepted our invitation. Uh, in the discussions behind this, what we thought it would make sense is for you to get an introduction to SRC for people who don't know it, and also to look at strategically how we believe our fields are going to evolve, so that that could be the basis for how we think uh, we will do our work moving forward and how this HIR roadmap will shape it. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to a collaborative talk. Uh, so I guess the first question is, so why are we all here? I mean, the first is to show how heterogeneous integration is the key for beyond more dissolved scaling, as we all know. Second is to share Esther's vision of the future of packaging. And third is, to, and finally, to encourage more collaboration between government, industry, and academia. So, the Syndicate Research Corporation has sponsored research and packaging for many years, um, with its members like Intel driving the future of heterogeneous integration. Um, IEEE integration, uh, heterogeneous integration roadmap sets out a vision that's bigger than any single program agency or organization can handle. I believe that the HR will enable scaling uh, beyond uh, and will shape the next generation of microsystems. So SRC set out a set of seven goals to promote research for continued cost-effective breakthroughs in hardware. The first three of these goals are packaging related like heterogeneous integration, 2D, 3D, SOC, system and package, photonics, and of course, in stream environments like automotive and space systems. The next four are focused more on the architectural improvements and automated, system, automated tools for design and validation, hardware and software security, and finally, ways to promote ease to, of scaling to create market opportunities. So, my reading of the HIR uh, is that it's an application-driven roadmap that aligns well with SRC's goals and covers similar areas that SRC's members have interest. Currently, SRC is sponsoring research spanning the different building blocks and technical areas of the HIR, as shown below. So I think we're well aligned in our needs. So SRC is a nonprofit consortium. We were formed in 1982 uh, when several US-based uh, semiconductor countries like Intel and IBM noted the need for a significant increase in US research in semiconductors and relevantly trained students for hire. It kind of was a desert at that point. Uh, SRC founded, was founded to drive innovations in research, collaboration within government, industry, and academia, and to focusing on transfer of technology between academia and industry. So who are we? Uh, SRC is a nonprofit consortium, as I said, of government industry partners who fund academic research in the semiconductor field. Uh, for almost 40 years, uh, SRC has sponsored over 2.2 billion in research uh, at, with over 2,000 global projects that have produced over 15,000 students. Yeah, this research has produced over 700 university and patents at 200, over 250 universities in 25 countries. So definitely a large, uh, footprint there. Some of the disruptive technologies that SRC has included are MRAM and copper interconnects, the high K dielectrics, FinFETs, we all know and love today, and nano sheets for God transistors. Just to name a few. So how does SRC work? Well, SRC manages collaborative research, pre-competitive collaborative research. Uh, we pulled the directions and funds from industry members with government agencies together to fund professors leading research projects. Uh, we have numerous smaller projects focusing on industry relevant topics along with larger centers to handle larger problems in scope. And what does industry and government get out of this research? Well, they get novel relevant technology, 
uh, from these projects, along with the IP rights to and the freedom to practice. And of course, highly trained students for hire. Our SRC members jointly define these research needs, fund the projects, and reap all the rewards. And as it says here, SRC membership occurs at the company level, and all company employees benefit from this membership. So let's go over some of the numbers about SRC. SRC uh, works with multiple government agencies to enable new funding opportunities. For almost 40 years, SRC has brought together government industry and academia to shape the semiconductor industry. Uh, we partner with the Semiconductor Industry Association to drive the expansion of government funding into the semiconductor space. Um, SRC has 21 different industry members, companies today, uh, which span the semiconductor industry from fabrication to memory and logic, uh, analog communication focused companies to equipment and materials manufacturers to system integrators and the EDA companies. Uh, SRC's members include seven of the top 10 in semiconductor companies in the world, including several attendees to this conference. It's great to see. Uh, even with all these semiconductor leaders, SRC is always looking to grow its membership. If you're interested, of course, feel free to contact me about your company can join SRC and its members to solve these uh, problems and challenges of the future. So SRC, SRC actively encourages industry employees to become liaisons on our projects. Uh, these liaisons come from the top semiconductor companies like Intel, IBM, AMD, who talked already in this conference. Uh, we have over 800 researchers collaborating with and contributing to that sponsored research. Uh, these liaisons reap the benefits of early access to new technologies by being on the cutting edge and having monthly or even weekly meetings with the professors uh, and help develop that workforce of the future they all need. Uh, every year, the best and the brightest liaisons are nominated by our professors and students uh, for the Mubu Khan Award. It's a prestigious honor honoring their contributions to the research. Ravi Mahajan of Intel is one of those winners uh, from 2015, and I'm sure will be a winner soon again. Uh, and as a former student himself, he's a great example of how, of coming full circle with SRC. Thank you again. Yeah, speaking of students, SRC is filling the gap of those highly trained, highly skilled students that we're, the industry is looking for, and especially in the packaging field. Uh, relevantly trained students are one of those most valuable outcomes of the funded research. Yeah, these students go and become the leaders and experts in their field, like Ravi, of course. Uh, another example, of, uh, even more famous, would be Lisa Su, CEO of AMD. Uh, she was an SRC funded student. She at MIT and is considered or is one of the most powerful women in business today. And you have to take my word for it. She's also on the Forbes list in 2020. And uh, SRC students are encouraged and promoted within our industry members uh, as they are future experts in their field. So SRC is broken into three main programs and I'll hi highlight portions of two of them. Uh, the Global Research Collaboration Program, GRC in short, has seven different focus areas as shown in the table. Uh, GRC's research spans topics of interest to our members. One of the interests I'd like to focus on today is packaging. I'm happy to talk about others if you're interested. So in 2014, SRC with its members realized there was a need to form a dedicated packaging research program. SRC had been doing very good research for years beforehand, but our members decided to focus their efforts and funds on the application drivers for evolving packaging technologies. Those marketing vectors include small, flexible, cost-effective learner connects, high compute density found in data centers and servers, embedded devices that are being placed in new extreme environments like automotive, and of course, small form factor, low cost applications like IoT. So the research program was built and focused on several different research directions. Some of the highlights are heterogeneous integration, advanced sensor packaging, optical interconnects, power and thermal management, non-destructive analysis, and reliability concerns, just to name a few. Beyond that catalog of industry relevant research projects, in 2018, SRC with its members saw the growing need for more research and heterogeneous integration. 
Uh, this led us to the formation of the Center for Hydrogen Integration Research and Packaging, known as CHIRP, nice name, in uh, January of 2019, led by Ganesh Subrayan of Purdue and Bhagat Samakala of Binghamton. This center aims to achieve more than more functionality that we all hope for. But this is a multi-million dollar research center, has multi-disciplinary multi projects uh, with many of the leading experts in the field, uh, who I see are also leading many portions of the HIR. Uh, the topics in heritage integration are numerous, as you all are aware, well aware. I'm glad to see many of the CHIRP and packaging professors and industry liaisons are integral in driving the HR development, along with our security, hardware security folks that I saw yesterday. As we're all aware, solicitations drive new research. Uh, SRC is soliciting, soliciting new research projects in five different research areas this year, uh, including packaging starting in the spring uh, 2021. All of you interested professors, if you're are encouraged to apply to these solicitations. And we do try to forecast and host these applications on our website. There's a link here. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll see more of you uh, join our ranks in the near future. Another portion of SRC's research portfolio is called the Joint University Microelectronics Program, JUMP for short. We always have fun names, uh, which is made up of large research centers. Uh, JUMP's vertical centers have these grand challenges we're trying to solve. And the horizontal centers are cross-cutting uh, that perform benchmarking and technology development. Uh, JUMP is supported by DARPA and 12 of our industry members that are fostering the next wave of similar technologies. I've highlighted two of these centers that, which have packaging-related work. And I'll focus on one of them. So I like this slide that because this shows how JUMP is connecting people and ideas from around the world to solve these grand challenges. So kind of showing a heat map of where our universities and uh, industry folks and government uh, agents are all uh, working together to solve uh, these grand challenges. So one of the JUMP centers is called the Center for Converged Terahertz Communications and Sensing, it's COM Center for short led by Mark Redwell of UC Santa Barbara and Ali Nikajad of Berkeley. Uh, this center is focused on the grand challenge of 140 gigahertz, massive LIMO hubs, Pico cells, and handset arrays, which you see as a future of RF communications. Uh, this multi-university center is driving new applications which are identifying colleges for the next generation of RF packaging, which is, should be quite relevant to you guys. Uh, some of the early work has demonstrated that our normal understanding of parasitics needs to be adjusted for near terahertz products and beyond. So now looking to the future. Uh, shaping the future is what research is all about. So how do we help? Um, let's start back and looking a little bit of the history. Uh, for that 40 year history, SRC has shaped the semiconductor industry starting with a set of 10 year goals that we set out at the beginning, which led uh, through various sources to the ITRS that we all know and love today. Uh, SRC worked with government and industry partners to fund numerous research programs to solve these industry relevant issues in the semiconductor industry. And we don't stop there. We're continuing this effort with the decadal plan, which I'll cover in a minute. So we, we set out this plan. So how, excuse me. Uh, so we set out this plan. So how does this uh, help? An example of how this research has benefited the semiconductor industry is shown in this technology transfer success story, starting with SRC sponsored research as one of our at University of Michigan on the similar line to estimation of microchips. This is one of our projects that we started in uh, 2012. Uh, this led to research that started the DARPA chips program. And that was highlighted at the first DARPA ERI summit. Uh, by Mike, Mary, Mike Mayberry. Intel, uh, Intel utilized this research to build uh, numerous products, but more specifically the Lakefield microprocessor, which is symbolic of Intel's strategic shift towards chiplet manufacturing. And then Lakefield is part uh, was integrated as part of Samsung's Galaxy uh, Book S, which of course we can all buy today, is available back in May of 2020. Wow. 
uh, showing the research to end products uh, in a reasonably short period of time. A kind of a great set of work there. So looking forward, uh, SRC is leading the consensus on the future of research needs for a semiconductor industry, which is called, we call the decadal plan for semiconductors. Uh, SRC brought together uh, experts from across the industry, academia and government to identify and quantify five seismic shifts which require research for the next decade and beyond. SRC along with SIA and its members are using this as a call for a massive increase in assuming that there are R&D funding from the government in the 2020s. As an example, in January 2021, the National Defense Authorization Act was passed, indicating that the government does have an increased appetite for hardware R&D uh, to be funded in the future. Doesn't mean there's money available now, there'll be money in the future because of this. So it's, they're starting the process. So that's great news for all of us. So the five seismic shifts that I'll go over in a second, or go over now, cover five grand challenges that we'd like to, that will be faced by the semiconductor industry in the next 10, 20 years. I mean, first of all, there's a deluge of analog data and smart sensing, um, and it's growing exponentially. Um, and like the human eye, somehow this analog data from the sensors and uh, all the world needs to be kind of reduced to knowledge. The human brain can compress a single image down to the important facts, showing like that, that, that 10 to the five reduction in bits to knowledge. It's, it's a hard challenge. And we see there's an exponential growth in memory demands, uh, which projected out outstrips the global silicon supply. So we'll need new memory uh, technology and storage solutions will be needed. I mean, one example that we're looking at now is DNA storage, uh, but that still needs a lot more development. And the always on available communications, I mean, in users uh, today, I think it's a requirement. Uh, I know I expect my internet to always work everywhere. And this is leading to an imbalance of capacity issues versus the data usage. And we gotta figure out something uh, that fixes that problem. And of course, hardware security is an ever growing issue as the growth of attack surfaces and these AI and quantum systems that are breaking the current paradigms uh, are on that verge of uh, happening. So. Uh, we need security solutions that last for 10, 20 years. Uh, and we know we're not really there today. And finally, uh, there's an ever growing rise for energy in our compute devices. And we know this is growing exponentially, which is significantly faster than our world's energy production. So I guess, how do these grand challenges from the decadal plan align with the heterogeneous integration and the folks on the call? There are five seismic shifts that will drive new technology areas that will enable the applications identified in the HDR. Uh, each of these seismic shifts will uncover new challenges and will need to be solved by packaging RD and heritage integration. We'll need to be able to integrate somehow DNA storage into an end device. Uh, we'll need radical uh, communication changes. We'll need new securities. We'll need uh, handling of all these uh, additional energy and computation needs. I mean, it's just, just beginning. So I'd like to focus on one of these five seismic shifts, global energy versus, or computer energy versus global energy production. So first let's look at this unprecedented exponential growth in computation and compute devices. As an example, ARM, one of our member companies, shared that ARM-based chips are shipping more than 842 chips a second in the fourth quarter alone of 2020. And that was during the time of COVID-19. I mean, that's 6.7 billion ARM-based chips in three months. And to date, ARM and their partners have shipped more than 180 billion ARM-based devices. I mean, this growth alone is exponential and shows no signs or indications of slowing down in the near future. So as you said that, this growth has been exponential and it's been noted by many experts and has been doing so for decades now. Um, I mean, this includes our growth of our smart 
devices, our personal devices, our data centers, our IoT devices, communication networks, personal computers, all working together to kind of drive an increase in the appetite for computations. So computations are one thing, but how does this equate to energy, which is that grand challenge that we talked about? First of all, let's look at converting the computing operations to binary transitions. As part of that decadal plan, we had a series of workshops and SRC with a group of experts did a survey of different microprocessors over the last 50 years, uh, plotting the instructions per second versus the bits per second. We noticed a, a strong correlation and that the data fits to uh, this equation we see here, MIPS equals K times, uh, times bits to the two thirds power. Uh, we have a very strong correlation with that, um, to that two thirds factor. Um, yeah, we don't know yet why that two, two thirds factor exists, but this will become part of that grand challenge that solve why, why do we have that two thirds factor? But we see a strong correlation there. So, uh, Combining these together leads to the exponential growth in binary transitions per year, as we show in this chart. But that's just part of the story. Now we need to include energy consumption per bit to understand the full level of energy required in our computing devices. As part of Moore's law scaling, the semiconductor industry has been pushing for compute, the compute energy per bit down as we get to new technology nodes and design optimizations. Looking over the last 25 years, the semiconductor industry has pushed to smaller geometries, lower voltages, yeah, from millimeters down to nanometers, uh, from five volts to less than one volt, we're looking at 0 0.8, 0 0.7 in the near future, maybe even below. As an example, the Intel uh, i9 uh, 7900X set new records for energy per bit as shown on the chart. But, we're fast approaching those limits of silicon scaling. So we're gonna hit the land there, limit, the tunneling, electron tunneling limits. So the question is, when are we gonna hit those? And this is gonna slow it down. So as we approach those limits, we know we're not gonna be able to necessarily hit them. We're gonna to try to get as close as we can, but it does show that there's an end in sight. So combining these trends and data sets together, we see there's a current trend that's fast approaching the world's energy production. The computer energy is growing exponentially as we've shown. And the world's energy production is only growing at a few percent, tens of percents a year. Um, and they've been on that uh, path for decades now. So the current trajectory would lead to all of our compute devices consuming all of the world's power within the next decade or so. Wow. And we know that won't happen. <laughs> There's lots of reasons why that won't happen. But so this is a challenge. Uh, the semiconductor industry is pushing for uh, new technologies and design operations today, which are moving to that target line as we show here. But let's say that gives us less than 10, 10 years or so based on this analysis. Even if we could somehow push that land hour limit, which we know we can't get to, that would only get us in the 2040s or a little beyond. Um, yeah, wow. So what do we do? Yeah, I mean, the question is, uh, how do we uh, change that exponent from a two thirds to one? But that's a lot easier said than done. Uh, we do have new paradigms of like quantum computing and brain inspired computing, like new morphic computing, advancements in AI. That'll be part of the answer, but I don't think that's the complete answer. Yeah, it's a big challenge that we kind of see looming on the horizon. Well, we all know that computer devices will never get all of the world's power. Uh, the economics and market dynamics will limit the amount of computer energy to a small fraction of the world's power. We're guessing around a thousand zips. Therefore, we need to challenge that compute directory uh, to, get, to get the industry past that thousand zips kind of level. So we'll need radically new architectures uh, to restore that scaling efficiency, uh, and new technologies like we talked about quantum, neuromorphic, maybe we, we hook in human brains. I don't know, uh, it's a big challenge. So we know with that power and cooling, we see the exponential growth in energy. Well, we're gonna have to somehow dissipate, uh, pro provide that power and then also dissipate that power. I mean, this is leading to crit critical constraints in packaging and uh, world's energy production and storage. 
uh, that we see no end in sight today. And as we all know, AI is becoming ubiquitous. Uh, we continue to grow an exponential rate for the beautiful future. Uh, AI is part of all of our devices and, uh, and is continuing to grow and solve our problems. Um, and we, we hope the AI is the solution, but we know it's not the only solution. So kind of the grand challenge that we talked about is to, first of all, we kind of need to understand a theory of computation. I was like, why do we have that trajectory of the two thirds path? We don't really know. So what we need is a comprehensive theoretical basis for that performance measure. Because if we know how to measure it and understand its source, then maybe we can try uh, have a new trajectory. Yeah, so today this is much less understood than like the theoretical basis for information storage communication. One of those being the channel limit that looks to the maximum uh, error-free data transmission. So this was just one of those five seismic shifts. We do have a full report. Uh, it's 140 pages. It's a, a great read, but lots of technical detail. And we do have a technical overview and then kind of a shortened version. Uh, these are all available now on the SRC website and you can download it. Uh, we are using this to uh, work to solicit additional government. So working with our industry members and SIA uh, to call for a massive growth in government funding per year to solve these seismic shifts. And this will lead to new uh, public and private partnerships and growth of existing ones uh, that will be initiated to cover the breadth of these seismic shifts with multiple disciplinary regimes. Uh, each of these um, challenges will lead to <laughs> innovations that we don't even know yet, but uh, we know that we need them. So the technical plan is setting out these kind of these grand goals. So let's see, how do these seismic shifts relate to packaging? Well, at terahertz frequencies and beyond, uh, we know that there's parasitic effects that we have seen some of our current research that we all know and love with, work with on a daily basis. They're changing. Traditional concepts of resistance and capacitance and inductance are changing. They're changing to things like fringing and roughness and index refraction. And those are just at the multi gigahertz range. Uh, we know that memory is becoming a big part of all edge applications. Uh, we are pushing more and more of the data and compute to the edge uh, because there's a limit to the communication bandwidth available. And of course, to protect that data for the end users, security is, and intellectual property is becoming, and knowledge is becoming the kind of the gold standard for the future. Um, Systems will be tailored to like specific products that drive the need for more integration of configurable memory to these devices with a variety of different memory paradigms. Like how would I inc include a DNA storage unit in a mobile device? I have no idea, but it's definitely a challenge. So we all know that devices will be integrating multiple technologies into a single package. Yeah, some of the previous speakers have noted uh, over the last couple of days uh, products today are integrating different technology nodes and passives, and those are beyond what a single monolithic chip can do. So we know that there's going to be a large and there's a necessity for uh, advancements in 2.5D and 3D integrations that will be required over the next 10, 20 years. And of course, heat and power delivery will continue to be challenges as we grow the uh, edge computing and data centers. Uh, we know that growth is exponential. Uh, as we push that compute energy, we know that we're going to consume more and more energy in, within our devices, and we'll need to solve those challenges. Uh, we do have some novel and exotic heating solutions that exist today, uh, but in general, these tend to be impractical for wide-scale production because of cost support requirements. They're just not portable to our own devices, and can I afford to put a water cooling system on an IoT device? I don't really think so. So here's some of the key takeaways I want you to take from this talk. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, here's a, the future rests on continued cost-effective breakthroughs in hardware. Uh, we know that advances in heterogeneous integration, 2D and 3D, SOCs, system and packages, photonics, and extreme environments. 
will drive R and D and the device of the future. And I do believe that hydrogen integration is a key enabler uh, for beyond more soft scaling that we're all uh, shooting for. Okay, so here are the key takeaways I'd like to take from this talk. Uh, scaling beyond Moore's law is fueled by heterogeneous integration. And the SOC's technical plan and IEEE's HR are two parts of that same objective. So the decadal plan is sending out some of these grand challenges uh, by defining what needs to happen. And I think the heterogeneous integration is uh, dictating how these can get to these goals. So there are two parts of that same research objective that everyone is uh, looking for. And SOC's members collaborate with academia to help solve these challenges of the future. And we're always looking for a new government and industry and academic partners to drive these research of the future and to solve these challenges that we know are looming on the horizon. So of course, if you're interested in collaborating with SRC, feel free to contact me. So thank you. Any questions, questions or comments? And thank you, John, for a great of... talk. I have a quick question. Of course. Thank you. Uh, what's the percentage of your industrial or academic uh, contributors from outside of the US? Uh, so from our universities? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we do find, uh, I don't really have a slide on that, but we do find uh, research around the world. Uh, probably this heat map kind of gives an idea, idea. But I would say we have between five and 10% of our research is uh, funded outside of the uh, US. I mean, there's definitely a US focus from an academic standpoint uh, within SRC. Um, and that, a lot of times when you have government funding, uh, there's definitely a connection with funding US universities. Uh, we know some uh, government agencies will only fund you if you only have US universities. Uh, but I would say our industry members take a broader, uh, gl more global view on it. And so that's why we do have a mixture of uh, US based universities and uh, foreign universities. Thank you. Of course, time zones always makes a difference, right? Yeah. Thank you. John, I have a uh, slightly sure. different question. When you look at the energy consumption, do you account for losses in the interconnects? And do you account for use conditions? As in, is this raw compute or is this compute for applications that demand compute? And is there a scale down of the energy? Uh, so we are looking at kind of uh, the raw compute for the world. And uh, I mean, we've done through surveys and uh, looking at uh, use cases. Uh, most devices, uh, at least a lot of these data centers and uh, AI farms, things like that, are computing uh, all the time or virtually all the time. And so there is there is some duty cycling, uh, but the we know that <laughs> they're always running. Uh, now we look at IoT devices and when we have billions and billions of those like Arm has talked about. Uh, these devices a lot more a lot a lot more are duty cycled. Uh, and that's kind of what's pushing us from that, I guess, current trajectory that if we look at these uh, data data intensive to that target. And as I talked about, we had design optimizations and re-architectures that are pushing us to that level. Um, and we can do a, a few more things maybe with power savings if we have more devices. But what does that get us? Five, 10 more years at the current trajectory? Um, and then we uh, have billions and billions of devices in the IoT world and the, the, the internet of everything. Uh, it's just continuing to grow. Uh, and so that's why there's definitely a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, there are uh, definitely a lot of people that say, okay, is this the way it is or things like that. Uh, we haven't included a lot of uh, like the parasitic losses within uh, interconnects and things like that yet in this analysis, but that would counteract potentially duty cycling. Uh, so that's why there's definitely discussions and ongoing analysis on that. I mean, if we could duty cycle everything a thousand to one or a million to one, then I guess that would solve everything, but exactly. then we wouldn't get our work done that we want or the expectations that we have today completed, right? Yeah. John, uh, you have a follow-up question. Uh, uh, I am assuming that the power that you have plotted here is the package level power. Uh, so this is actually, uh, this would be uh, for all of our compute devices. So this would be uh, 
within the DAI, within mostly within the DAI, which would then equate to package level power. Uh, we don't really, we're not really including like losses through passives and like that with this analysis. Uh, mm -hmm. As you said, we have due to cycling. We have, uh, we do have losses there that all together kind of balance it out, but it's not really changing that trajectory a whole lot. So, so my question then is, you know, what, what is the power that's explained in the quantum computing solutions? Does that include the refrigeration power or does it just, you know, stick to, you know, if that's the case, then there are quantum solutions that don't require cooling. How is it factored in? Yeah, so uh, that's what we were saying. We need, uh, based off the current paradigms of uh, computation, the current binorm and Harvard architectures that we have in all of our devices, um, we know we need to think of things differently. And quantum computers are different. I mean, they have these uh, uh, tangled qubits that most times require uh, very large and expensive freezing cooling apparatus. Uh, I do know there's some initial work that's uh, showing that maybe we can do quantum computing at room temperature, uh, but then there are people that say maybe that doesn't work. Uh, so there's definitely work that's ongoing there. And that's what we're saying is this is probably part of the solution. Quantum computers will be developed. They will uh, change that trajectory. But will that get us to kind of where we need to go to get us to basically the end of the 21st century? I'm not sure, um, and unless we think rethink of things. I mean. A uh, quantum computer is not the only answer, but that is definitely part of the answer. Thanks. John, there's one more question. Uh, can you address interconnect power and photonics? I think you talked about interconnect, but can you also talk about photonics and the impact it will have on power? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, that's one of the things that we talked about. We know that, uh, where did I have that? Okay, uh, I'll just talk about it here. Um, we know that uh, there's definitely an em emergence of uh, photonic communications and interconnects. Uh, but converting to uh, silicon where we're doing all the real work right now, uh, that conversion is, not, is pretty costly. And so that optical links are uh, driving communications. Uh, we are looking at what, what would the optical computer look like? What would an optical uh, neural network look like? Uh, and how do we move compute into the optical range? Uh, so we know that maybe another part of that uh, change that maybe photonics is part of the solution and photonics is still kind of in its early development. I mean, we still have, we have products out there. We have a lot of uh, developments being done. I mean, we find research in photonics at multiple universities and have shown some great results. And even our, our members like Global Founders is using, are using this photonics research in uh, some of their leading edge projects that they have today. Um, yeah. So I don't really have a, a lot with that today, but this is mostly focused on the silicon. Uh, but we know that will definitely help change this trajectory as we move more and more there. John, would you speak um, on the SRC um, initiative on new emerging materials in the packaging area? Um, yeah, so uh, as uh, Ravi being one of our uh, leaders in uh, that space, uh, uh, we've basically been funding uh, research in the uh, packaging realm for many years now. Um, one of those uh, things we talked about is we're looking at, we're always looking at new materials, uh, new uh, interconnect technologies, uh, new solder and bother, uh solder bumps. And uh, this definitely is something that we are actively working on. And so this is uh, something we're doing, but we know that there's a lot more needed. Uh, we look at a few things and say, okay, this might work, but a lot of times we know it doesn't work. And so we do learn a lot from those research as well. Uh, and then we find those ones that uh, will change like copper interconnects that we had uh, that needed research that was in developed. And then that becomes now becomes like the mainstream. Uh, so we're, we're testing many different types of devices, types of materials. Uh, it's definitely ongoing work. And uh, these will definitely be part of the uh, research going forward. Thank you very much. Of course.